I'm back, I got hard tools, and I'm here to break up some rock. I already started, I'm gonna pry away all of this wall because as you can see, back there, there is space that goes down. And based on the fact that fluorite was coming from this ground section, I'm gonna loosen this up as well. So happy to have this one out of the way. These are all coming from the wall up here. Birthday cake celebration. Now that that app light is out of the way, we're gonna go for what's in here. Um, yum, yum, yum. Oh yeah, soft dirt, do you see it? There's a feldspar with a cube. Yeah, this is the hot spot. Oh, no, oh, and they're twins. Here we go. Here we go. Reactivated. I'm going to forget it. I got to put it on the birthday cake. Yes, sir. All of them are coming from right here. Lower down, the better it's been. I feel something terminated. Cute cubes. I will lick your dirt. And it just goes down and down and down and down and down. Let's go deeper. Just gonna get all of this stuff down. All right, time to see what we caught. Lots and lots of feldspar cluster coming from up in the top. Fishing through this crack and try to get back up in that crack that off the wall this that was wedged in there and the dirt is like wet all fresh Yeah, I didn't think much either until you got that face and that face. Just like stuck up in that. I got it, I got it, I got it. If it's a fluoride, I totally busted it to awfulness. It looks like a quartz. Oh man, and it was a pretty one. Oh, it's so bad. There's the termination. Do you see it? Oh man, this is tragic. It's like pulling your dead friend out of a river or something. Oh, it wasn't that beautiful anyway. No, it was like a dead enemy, pulling a dead enemy out of a river. Now we got straight down gap. We got good quartz. Check what's under underneath it. I'm pretty positive it's a fluorite. Oh my God, it's right on the end. And that crack is relentless. Yep, it's a fluorite. We saved a life today. That crack just goes down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's good or bad, but that really needs to come out. So I'm gonna get it out. I'm gonna bust out this. Some okay feldspar. Opens up in here and there's just bigger and bigger plates. There goes that one. I'm back. I have already found two feldspar clusters, these have just come from the hole. Since I can't get any deeper that way, I'm just gonna have a dig a hole here. That's where the feldspars came from. I have only just arrived. It is 
you know those days when your car breaks down the tow truck guy is delayed which delays your appointment getting your car worked on uh it's like the universe is giving you a sign not to do something but you ignore it and you do it anyway this is the one day a week to prospect so we prospect no matter what this is just a strategy game What's up, mommy long legs? <gasps> no fluoride in the upper level. Just felt promise. Uh, the juice was worth the squeeze. A good one. I don't see any fluoride, so this is confirmation. If fluoride was forming in the top, there would be at least one cube on this. So, no. All of the fluoride is forming right here. Cooled and contracted and fractured here. And I guess, I mean, the fluorite would have gone like that. And the rest is gone. I want to show my reclamation and encourage this for everyone else. It's really easy to do. So I have one here, which that's as thick as the vein got. So you can see as we move down, it gets a little thicker here. So... Uh, but still not prominent quartz. You can see it right there. And then continuing down, yeah, we have the majority of the quartz here. And some bugs. And then only at depth am I finding any of the feldspars. All the feldspars are adjoining this left wall where the, the applite pockets. And you can see some here uh, facing left, right, uh, this way. So yeah, that's the only occurrence of feldspar and it's only getting better going deeper. That's why it's not worth pursuing any further. I'm gonna cover it all up and we're gonna move on and find a new pocket today. Less than 20 minutes later, there's spot one, two, the longer hole, three, four, and five, the biggest one. 20 minutes, that's all it takes. And then down there, I mean, I feel like it really doesn't matter that much, but I just smoothed it out. And let's move on to some new ground. This is the finale of part three. All of these specimens collected here. And the introduction to not part four, but a whole new series where another pocket has been located on the very same vein, but half a kilometer to three fourths of a kilometer away in which this material is being recovered. I've just broken into the beginning of a pocket, which is slumped, it is collapsed, but I am in the clay region where terminated crystals are showing their faces, one out of every three rocks picked out of the pocket. So uh, this video right now is intended to explain how I arrived at this new location with the help of a friend uh, pioneering the area and found that the continuation of this vein, which is part three, goes all the way across a valley, across this ephemeral stream, which means it only flows when there's heavy precipitation, to another peak over here. It pockets here, and then the slope on a ridge line, it pockets again. And that's where this material is coming from. So I wanna take just a moment to describe briefly, recap on the lengthy video of part two, and tie this in to the next pocket that has just begun to emerge. Let's zoom out to the regional view. This is Pikes Peak Batholith, in which we have a molten pluton, which rose up through the cold, dense surrounding uh, rock, metamorphosed it, and that's how we get this spherical body. Now, the reason for the pegmatite formation is that we first need a crack, a physical attribute for the fluid to fill, uh, which contains these feldspar, quartz, and fluorite crystals. And how that happens 
is that we have this spherical magma body which contacts the cold, dense, metamorphic rock on the outside, and like layers of an onion, these ex the exterior cools the quickest, then the interior, and then further and further and further towards the middle, where this is the last to crystallize, as it turns from magma to granite. This indicates the layers, like an onion, this line here, where we have essentially about the same temperature rock, so it's all about the same temperature along the outside, a little warmer on the inside. And as these layers cool, they fracture. And they fracture perpendicular to the contact with the cold host medium. Because this is all the same temperature, this ring, uh, the out outermost layer of the onion. So as it contracts, a uh, fracture forms, creating a joint which all the residual liquid flows through and creates the vein. So that's the review of, of part two. Now let's talk about the vein. The cooling evolution of this particular pegmatite is that all of this, all of this granite on the outside, these scalloped umbrella type shapes have already solidified. Now in that process, we have residual elements that are not traditional components of minerals and granite, such as uh, feldspar, biotite, muscovite, quartz, and uh, hornblende, they're not components of the granite. So fluorite is, fluorine is a perfect example of one of those elements. And it's incompatible due to its electronegativity, its ionic radius, and certain properties of fluorine uh, as a mineral. It, it's like a Lego, getting a Lego block with a puzzle. You're putting together a two-dimensional puzzle on a flat surface. You have a three-dimensional Lego block. It's not a part of it. It doesn't fit with the rest of the whole scheme. So it cannot be integrated into the minerals that are a part of the granite. It can in some situations, such as with fluorine, uh, with uh, phenakite and topaz. But in this scenario, it is occurring as its own separate entity as these beautiful fluoride cubes. Now... The behavior, physical and chemical properties of pegmatites and this residual liquid, which is the last thing, very last thing to ultimately crystallize, it's behaving different than the rest of the granitic melt because it's enrichment and volatiles, which uh, alter the properties of the liquid. However, one thing that we can carry over is that this pegmatite being the thinnest where I've these each X indicates this is approximately to scale five meters. That's about the size of a of a shovel and a rock pick. And this is where we're doing most of the work where all the fluorine, the purple polka dots are occurring and the fluorite crystals right above. We have high iron enrichment where these crosses are. Uh, so Fe iron uh, primary oxide is, is hematite. So it cools, which I, I did all these test holes up here. It gets the thinnest. It cooled quickest with the most irregularity or most entropy, if you will, at the edges. And then it gradually crystallizes. This represents a sequence of crystallization all the way till we get to the middle. So that fluorine was present out here. But since it's incompatible, it migrates all towards the center where we have the very thickest determined section of the pegmatite. And you know, since it can't escape, then it has to crystallize. So that's why all the fluoride is concentrated here. If we wanted to find more fluorite crystals, we would need to go back. These uh, dashed lines represent the projection of the pegmatite. Uh, I did obtain an attitude of the pegmatite. Attitude is a geologic term to describe two different things of a linear geologic feature. Strike, which measures the direction of the linear geologic feature and dip, which measures the angle in which it is descending into the earth. So that, that attitude here, I mean, it, it shouldn't mean too much to you, but this is what they look like. South 38 degrees west, 88 degrees northwest. That last part is the angle, the dip. And the first is the strike. So direction and dip. And you can see that I put 88 degrees northwest, meaning it's almost 90 degrees. And in some cases, like here, where these crosses are, it is actually vertical. Now, the so this forms 
the projection of the vein. It, it goes into the mountain. So uh, to find more fluorite, we would need to chip away all of this boulder and get further back into the central zone following the projection boundaries of the vein which also means on the back side of this is an area for investigation because this vein very well could go all the way through the mountain and be found on the back side. We would find that by using a compass, by following this specific attitude, walking all the way to the back. And I did confirm uh, and looking for the presence of fluoride and this pegmatite with similar features. I did confirm that this attitude is perpendicular. So it is in fact from one of these perpendicular fractures that occurred from the cooling of this uh, Pluton complex. Okay, now on the other side, like this is really important and something I didn't realize when first encountering this vein is that I came from this way and I saw some float up here. I walked there. I was like, oh, that vein tapers into nothing. And it's basically like, okay, it goes off the cliff. There's nothing more that can be done with it. False, not true. Because you, because across this valley, since the elevation increases over here, that vein continues all the way over here, as I mentioned. So that is where all of the future prospecting is going to be done, as well as even further. The next ridge line over, we're going to find how far this vein goes because it's very significant. Even though it's thin, it goes for a very long ways. And there are new geologic features such as bull quartz, uh, a dike, a lot of new things to interpret at this new location. But I did want to mention uh, the direction of the future videos and how they pertain to be able, being able to map with some degree of certainty where you can find volatile rich pegmatites along the igneous metamorphic contact of a batholith or pluton complex.